and certainly uh, I'll be happy to take any questions or whatever Dr. Gerson wants to do next. Oh, thanks very much, Rajan. Very nice uh, presentation and nice tips and tricks. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, one is, how do you actually measure, you say one's 50 centimeters, your BP, and your common channel is 150. Is that sort of just eyeballed, or are you using some type of measuring device? How do you know? Exactly? So when I use the Debakey, you know, I use the, the silver part of the Debakey. Now, obviously, over a period of now doing this for several years, we sort of developed a gestalt for how much is 5 centimeters. But when you're first learning, you can measure, for instance, the silver part on those Debakey graspers. And you can estimate from there if that's about, that's about four centimeters on my instruments. So a little bit longer than that would be five centimeters. And I count out aloud each time I'm measuring. And I measure five centimeters at a time. Some of my partners measure 10 centimeters. I just use five because that's a little bit more than the silver part on my debakey. And I can guide my trainees to appropriately measure that way. Great. Um, let me ask you again another question is um, some surgeons advocate a sort of a double staple technique of the JJ where you fire the stapler in one direction and then you fire the stapler in the other direction to help prevent kinking at your uh, jejun or jejunostomy. Have you had a, any troubles with kinking there with your technique? No, I, you know, I, I really have not. And in part because I, clo I uh, suture close the common enterotomy and then when I, when I close the mesenteric defect, I sort of bring it up all the way um, and I know that some people talk about the Brolin stitch to sort of prevent that kinking. I think my mesenteric closure sort of does that by approximating the rule limb to the biliary limb. And again, this anastomosis is pretty wide open because the bowel itself has sufficient uh, diameter at, at the jejunum in that location. And then by closing it uh, using suture, the chances of narrowing it down are pretty low. I think sometimes uh, if you're not experienced and you do a staple closure, you might be a little bit more prone to that, and that's certainly where people use that double staple technique a lot more. And I couldn't tell, you may have said this, but are you doing an anti-colic, anti-gastric? Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, I am using an anti-colic, anti-gastric approach to this. We uh, you know, initially when I started learning how to do this, I used retrocolic, but the EEA technique really works very, very well with the anticolic, anti-gastric approach. Now, any tips when you have a shortened mesentery and it seems like the small bowel that your rulum has a hard uh, row to hoe to reach the, uh, your pouch? So in those, those circumstances, you know, the anticolic, anti-gastric using the EEA really works very well uh, because it, I mean, I've, I can't remember the last time I really had to release the mesentery for it to reach. Now, that is a bigger problem when you are holding the bowel and trying to use a, either a hand suture technique or a linear cutter technique. But, you know, when you're using the EEA stapler, you sort of just use the EEA stapler to drag the bowel up carefully, of course, so you don't tear the bowel. But you drag the bowel up and engage it, and once you've got it engaged, you know, it, it just seems to work out fine. So it's very, very rare that I've had problems with like a foreshortened mesentery. Okay, and then one final question before we get to our next speaker. <clears throat> um, do you close the defect between the anticolic rue and the transverse colon? That's a very good question. You know, I mean, that would be what would technically be the Peterson's defect. I have not, but, you know, I don't know whether I should... I should do it or not. I'd look to the others on the panel to see what they suggest. I mean, I've, I've traditionally not closed it, but I would, uh, you know, certainly people do close that and my partners close that defect. So um, I'd be curious to hear what others have to say about it. That's great. Um, we're going to save about 15 minutes um, toward the end. And he is going uh, to talk about sleeve gastrectomy tips and tricks. And again, Rajan, thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful. Thanks, Keith. Uh, I'd like to thank Sages for the opportunity to uh, present this talk on sleeve gastrectomy. I'm going to focus the majority of the talk on technical
tips and tricks, but I'm going to start off just with some background information on the sleeve and I think some important preoperative considerations. This is just my uh, disclosure slide. So we're certainly seeing a surge in the demand for sleeve gastrectomy over the last several years uh, as interest or demand in the band has faded. And I think it's really uh, replaced the band as the procedure which many patients view as less radical or invasive uh, compared to the bypass. There's just a certain segment of our patients that present for bariatric surgery that just for whatever reason will not even consider a bypass. And I think the sleeve has provided a nice niche for that. Um, and I think you've also seen uh, that it's a procedure that is, has a shorter learning curve for surgeons. So the uh, availability or access to a surgeon who can perform a sleeve is probably greater than that for surgeons who uh, perform bypass, which is uh, probably a technically more challenging procedure to do. Uh, I did my first sleeve uh, around 2007, and at the time, um, we had very little data on it as a standalone procedure, and it was very difficult to get insurance coverage. And since that time, we've seen a growing body of literature that has really shown very good results with the sleeve, and I think we're actually going to have a presentation on that later uh, this evening. Uh, but I think as things stand today, most insurance companies, if they provide bariatric coverage for a bypass or a band, are also going to cover uh, the sleeve. I think the exceptions would be, uh, ironically, Medicare patients who are over 65, some of the patients that may be the best candidates for a sleeve. Um, in terms of efficacy compared to the other procedures, uh, you can debate the numbers, uh, but I think in general most uh, bariatric surgeons would agree that the sleeve falls somewhere between the band and the bypass and weight loss. I think it tends to yield more weight loss than the band, but not quite as much as the bypass. Um, one of the uh, uh, downsides of the sleeve is that uh, we do have a, a, a relative paucity of good long-term data compared to the bypass. The bypass has been around for over 50 years, uh, and the sleeve really has just been, uh, I think, done, been done widespread as a standalone for less than five years in general. Uh, we don't know, compared to the bypass, the degree or trend for weight regain. We certainly know that patients can uh, gain, regain some weight back with any bariatric procedure, but we don't really know where the sleeve stands in the realm of bypass or compared to bypass in the band. There's also been some concern for uh, evolving GERD, uh, and I think the, the data is mixed on that, and I'll touch on that uh, in a few slides. Um, indications, I think the majority of the patients that we see, uh, really uh, it's a personal preference. They can, uh, we don't force them or, or, or strong arm them into any particular uh, procedure for the most part. Um, and as I mentioned, I think a lot of patients are just uh, choosing sleeve um, as, as, the, as the procedure uh, that they feel to be the safest and lowest risk with, uh, all, uh, with uh, delivering decent results. Uh, but there are some specific indications where we would strongly recommend or mandate a sleeve over a bypass. Patients who have uh, some um, either chronic or acute uh, abnormality of the gastric or duodenal mucosa that would mandate long-term surveillance, such as a chronic ulcer. Uh, we've seen some patients with duodenal carcinoid. Occasionally we'll have a patient with intestinal, gastric intestinal metaplasia. Um, and I think that's a nice niche for the sleeve. It allows us to surveil and have access to uh, the entire stomach and duodenum as opposed to a bypass. Patients that are higher risk or every minute in the OR uh, uh, places a patient at a higher risk. Uh, it's not all, many of our patients, but there are some patients that fall into this category. And sleeve is clearly a, a quicker procedure. I would say in general it's at least half the OR time. Uh, there's patients who have chronic NSAID use. Uh, we know that that use is going to continue likely after surgery and in the setting of a bypass. This certainly places them at a high risk for uh, anastomotic ulcers. Uh, although patients can get ulcers with a sleeve, uh, it tends to be, I think, a lower risk, a less ulcerogenic operation. Uh, certainly patients who have excessive adhesions and or ventral hernia. Uh, we have a very active hernia program here at CMC, uh, and many of the patients that initially present for ventral hernia ultimately come to see us for a sleeve first. Uh, there's also some data that uh, a sleeve may be a good uh, procedure uh, for gastroparesis. 
Um, but I think it's important to note that if you're going to do a bypass and a patient uh, has potentially prohibitive uh, adhesions, um, that it's a good idea to consent them for a backup procedure. So you pre consent them for their bypass, but if you encounter intraoperatively excessive adhesions, you'll have that uh, ability to do a sleeve without having to wake them up and bring them back two weeks later for the sleeve. Uh, contraindications, there are very few absolute contraindications. Uh, I think many surgeons believe that, that one of the uh, more firm contraindications would be uh, Barrett's esophagus, uh, because it certainly makes any subsequent uh, esophagectomy uh, very difficult. Uh, there's many surgeons that would feel that a large hiatal hernia is best uh, uh, repaired and uh, 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 addressed with a bypass as opposed to a sleeve, and the same goes with severe GERD. But I think the uh, severe GERD is probably more controversial. Preoperative considerations. Uh, I think that I think one of the important things that uh, with bariatric surgery and probably any uh, procedure is to align the patient's expectations with what is likely to be delivered with that procedure. Uh, I think uh, patients' outcomes are going to be best when uh, they match that of the surgeon's expectations and what we typically see with the procedure. And I think too often in bariatric surgery we see patients come in with excessively high uh, expectations for weight loss. And that's particularly important with the sleeve, I think, when they're considering a procedure that in all likelihood is going to give them a little less weight loss than a bypass. Uh, I think for all our bariatric patients, we try to maximize preoperative weight loss, uh, lifestyle changes. We put all our patients on a two-week uh, uh, preoperative, quote, unquote, liquid diet, just a low-calorie diet. Uh, we uh, ag aggressively work up our patients, most of with uh, upper endoscopy, to screen for large hiatal hernias or uh, advanced signs of GERD, and, and these patients are often steered towards uh, a bypass. So some of the key technical steps of sleeve gastrectomy, the first uh, with any laparoscopic procedure is access to the abdomen and trocar configuration. The next is uh, 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 close inspection of the hiatus to make sure there's no occult hiatal hernia, uh, and a left cruise dissection to help mobilize the uh, fundus, uh, the greater curve mobilization, uh, and then dissection uh, of the fundus uh, not only off the left cruise and diaphragm but also off the posterior portion, uh, the posterior wall of the stomach off the lesser sac. Um, the next would be uh, advancing the calibration and uh, calibration tube and uh, positioning this. Uh, and probably the most important part is, is the vertical staple line. If this is not done correctly, there can be significant mor morbidity and, and mortality from the procedure. Uh, and finally, removal of the specimen. This is a nice paper. I think for anyone who's doing bariatric surgery, I think it's, it's, this is a, it's certainly a uh, important paper to review. Uh, came out in 2012, and while it fell short of develop or d uh, delivering a, a pure standard of care or consensus statement, um, it, it essentially uh, surveyed surgeons who were deemed expert surgeons, and these were sleeve surgeons who had at least 500 cases under their belt from around the world. Uh, collectively, it represented more than 12,000 cases, and they and they surveyed sur these surgeons on a wide variety of technical uh, factors as well as preoperative uh, uh, controversial issues and management of complications. Um, and where there was greater than 70 percent agreement, they called that a consensus. And I'll be referring to that as we go through some of the technical portions of the procedure, uh, emphasizing some of the key findings uh, of this uh, uh, consensus statement paper. I'm going to start with uh, the trocar configuration. It has changed somewhat uh, with my technique. Uh, this was my initial uh, trocar configuration, and it was uh, derived mainly from bypass. I had a Nathanson uh, sub-xiphoid uh, retractor brought in through a 5-millimeter incision, and then a right 5-millimeter uh, uh, subcostal uh, incision, or a trocar. Uh, I'm going to try to move this cursor here. Uh, the surgeon, patient's in supine position. The operating surgeon is on the right-hand side of the, of the patient. Uh, the staplers are, are going to come through the 15-millimeter trocar here. This will also be the area where the, uh, uh, the stomach is removed. I initially had uh, put an 11-millimeter trocar here. This was the camera trocar, and then two fives out on the left side for the assistant. Uh, my new revised trocar configuration uh, I have dropped or removed one of these five trocars on the left side. We found that typically you only need one uh, uh, assistant uh, instrument on the left side, and the assistant drives the camera with their left hand. Uh, a five millimeter trocar here in the right subcostal, and I've, I've 
uh, tended to drop this more inferiorly, this 15 trocar. If this trocar is too high, when you come in with your stapler, sometimes it can be difficult to come down uh, on and get a nice clean um, uh, bite of the uh, antrum. You're almost coming down on it too vertically, whereas if you drop this trocar uh, towards the feet or inferiorly, it gives you more room to get that stapler in for your first firing. Uh, by going to a 5 millimeter scope with our improved optics with the, with the scope, I think it also cuts down on pain in this area. So this is our initial view. Once we have our Nathanson liver retractor in, we're going to look at the hiatus. This is an example of, of an early, very small type 1 hiatal hernia where you have a, a dimpling at the hiatus. And I think the data from both the, the band uh, and the sleeve would indicate that any uh, uh, laxity or small hiatal hernia um, at the hiatus should be repaired. Uh, you're dealing with restrictive procedures, and it's likely over time that, that that the chronic proximal dilatation of the stomach and even distal esophagus may accentuate or accelerate uh, expansion of that defect. Uh, if it's a small defect like this, typically I'll do just to sect out the anterior half of the uh, hiatus, uh, reduce the sac, mobilize the esophagus, and put a figure of eight permanent suture there anteriorly. If it's a bigger hiatal hernia, I'll do a full circumferential uh, dissection uh, around this area uh, and repair it just like you would with any other hiatal hernia with a posterior chiroplasty, often with the placement of some type of reinforcing biomesh. This is, um, let's see if we can get this video to play here. This is a view of the left uh, uh, and uh, angle of hiss. This is the first part of the operation where we'll come in and, and essentially uh, see if I can get my pointer here. We're going to take this off the left uh, diaphragm. You have to watch out for the uh, 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 vessels here coursing on the diaphragm. But I think freeing this up helps when you reach the most superior part of your uh, short gastric division, having already divided and mobilized the upper part of that stomach, I think makes that step easier. Uh, the next step of the procedure is mobilization of the greater curve, and if this is do not done correctly, you can have uh, significant bleeding, uh, either from injury to the spleen, which is always a concern, uh, or more commonly, a retraction of your vessels if they're not proper properly uh, sealed. And once they retract up towards the spleen, it can be very difficult to control. Uh, I think one uh, couple uh, uh, pearls here. One, unlike a Nissen or an anti-reflux procedure where your stomach is staying in and you have to worry about burning the stomach, the nice thing about a sleeve is that you can you can burn the stomach up for the majority of the along the greater curve because that stomach is going to come out. So we typically hug the stomach. We have good strong lateral reta retraction, and you're staying. Your goal is to stay in be the plane between the stomach and the gastroepiploic vessels. Uh, I will often, often ligate the gastropopoic vessel, and I'll, I'll show a, a clip of that. Um, initially, I had used uh, harmonic scalpel, uh, but I've gone to using the quote-unquote vessel sealers, either Ligasure or Enseal, and I think they do provide a little better hemostasis, particularly high up on the larger short gastrics. Uh, I think the other tip would be that if you're uh, high up on those last few uh, short gastrics up by the diaphragm and you're having difficulty, make sure that you've mobilized uh, the, the posterior gastric wall completely off the lesser sac and essentially isolated those short gastrics both uh, so you have a nice uh, uh, inferior plane, uh, I'm sorry, a posterior plane, uh, uh, and I think it's easier to take those final vessels um, with the posterior attachments taken out. Um, this is a view of our uh, uh, initial greater curve mobilization. Um, you can see the gastropoic epiploic here. Uh, so we're dividing the attachments between the stomach and gastroepiploic. I typically take a few bites here, divide this, and then I'll come back here and I'll place the vessel sealer across the gastropoic here. I won't divide it, but I think it essentially takes the pressure head out of the more upstream uh, gastropoploic. And with that technique, I've seen a, a dramatic reduction in the oozing and bleeding higher up. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back one here. We just skipped over a slide. Uh, this is a, a view of our last uh, division on the short gastrics high up. And you can see it's helped that we've already dissected that top part at the beginning of the procedure. It gives us a window to, to aim for. Uh, and it's very important uh, to completely mobilize the posterior wall of the fundus here. 
Uh, I like to, to dissect this down so that you can see the more posterior aspect of, of the left cruise here. Uh, and this is important when it comes time to stapling high up on the stomach so that you're able to completely staple and remove that excess fundus. And I think it gives you more control of your stapler when the posterior wall of the stomach is released. In terms of calibrating the sleeve, uh, if you look at the literature, uh, it's all over the place. It goes as low as <clears throat> 20 French, uh, mid-20 French bougie up to a 60 French. Uh, but I think, again, going back to that consensus statement paper, um, most of the surgeons in that paper were using a, uh, a sizing tube, whether it be an endoscope or a bougie, somewhere in the 32 to 36 French range. There was 87 percent consensus on that. Uh, I think the advantage of the bougie is it can be passed by an anesthesiologist or a CRNA. You don't have to scrub out and, and pass it. We have the luxury of having fellows. It's a two-man operation. Uh, and I've gone to using the endoscope. I think there's several advantages of it. One is it's lighted, so you can clearly identify the end of it and, and position it correctly along that lesser curve. Uh, there are times when the OG tube that the anesthesiologist pass uh, does not adequately decompress the stomach, and going in with that endoscope allows you to suction out any excess uh, uh, fluid or air. And it also uh, it makes a nice uh, uh, final step where you just, at the end of the procedure, are able to pull that endoscope back and, and look at the configuration of your sleeve and leak test it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the data is still out there. It's unclear exactly whether uh, uh, a, bougie, a, a smaller bougie size or larger bougie size uh, significantly affects weight loss as long as you're within a reasonable range. We certainly know that as you decrease the size of your bougie less than a 32 French, the risk of a stricture, which is probably uh, of the most significant long-term morbidity with a sleeve, uh, goes up. Uh, next uh, important step is, is the vertical staple line. Uh, and if you look at some of the major complications that stem out of sleeve gastrectomy, they often arise from this step of the procedure, uh, whether it be bleeding from the staple line, uh, certainly an anastomotic leak, uh, or I'm sorry, a staple line leak is a very morbid uh, a complication, and I think there's things you can do during your stapling to help reduce that uh, risk. Uh, stricture, as I mentioned, uh, um, it can really, uh, I think, haunt the patient and the surgeon long term, and, and patients uh, uh, often can present with a delayed presentation with a stricture. We typically see narrowing around the second or third firing in the region of the angularis where the stomach makes a curve to the patient's right side. Uh, and I'll go over some technical uh, uh, pointers on that to help avoid stricturing in that area and avoid twisting of your sleeve. Uh, I think we all know that the stomach has variable thickness. It's, thick, it's, it's the most thick at the antrum uh, and, and thins out as we go uh, superiorly towards the fundus. Uh, the, I think it's important when you're providing the lateral tension on the stomach when you're stapling it to have equal tension on the anterior and posterior walls to re take out that posterior redundancy. Uh, that being said, when you reach the final firing up around the GE junction, most surgeons uh, agree that you should uh, uh, veer out and uh, it's uh, place the patient at a higher risk if your staple line is flush with the GE junction as opposed to flaring out and leaving about a centimeter of stomach uh, lateral. This is a picture of our, our first firing. Uh, and uh, a couple things to point out here. One is that this is an echelon or an ethicon uh, stapler, which we use for our sleeves. Uh, and the, the we typically are going to use either a green or black load. Certainly for a big male patient, we typically use a, a green load. I'm sorry, a black load. Um, for some of our smaller female patients, I will often use a green load. Uh, and again, there was 87 percent consensus on that uh, international consensus paper. Uh, Again, it's very important to reach under the, under, uh, the posterior, under the stomach and grab the posterior wall. The posterior wall, as we know, tends to have more redundancy. Uh, so you want to take out that extra redundancy so you have an equal amount of stomach on your sleeve anteriorly and posteriorly. And if you don't do that, you're going to find that uh, you, your stomach or staple line is going to tend to twist, which places the patient at a higher risk for stricturing and narrowing of their sleeve. Uh, other important thing is to uh, take the epiploic vessels completely off the stomach. You're using a green load or a black load stapler here. If you leave the epiploics on the distal uh, uh, greater curvature of the stomach and you staple across that, those larger staplers are, are, are not going to seal those vessels well. So you want to take those epiploic vessels completely off the stomach. 
Uh, on the echelon uh, staplers, it tends to suck the tissue back into the crotchet anastomosis. So when you clamp your tissue, you want to leave about a two to three millimeter gap in the crotchet anastomosis to account for that uh, uh, suction effect or that backwards motion of the tissue into the uh, crotch of the stapler. If you overload that crotch, uh, particularly in the very thick antrum, the risk of a staple misfiring increases. There's some controversy on, on where exactly you should start your transection point, but again, there was about a 92% consensus on, on starting it somewhere between two and six centimeters from the pylorus. So this is how it looks. We use staple line reinforcement, uh, and you can see that the uh, uh, this is our first firing. The second and third firings in this area, again, are the areas where you're at highest risk for uh, uh, narrowing your, your sleeve uh, in the region of the angularis, which is right up here. Um, always, I think, with any uh, laparoscopic procedure where you have multiple staple lines, you want to check your, your, the crotch of your uh, staple line and clear the debris. If you get a staple laying here and the next firing goes across that, it increases the risk of a uh, uh, stapler misfire. Uh, I think it's also important uh, to understand that the weakest part of the staple line is this crotch. So every subsequent fire should be just to the left of that uh, crotch. So you're leaving the weak part of the staple line on the remnant, which will ultimately come out. This is our uh, final firing. Um, I'm just going to back up. It skipped over one here. Uh, so this is, uh, we're approaching our final firing high up on the fundus, uh, your pancreas, you're looking into the lesser sac. You can see that we've cleared out all of our posterior attachments. We've mobilized the greater curve. You want to have a nice view in here and reach up, and I will grab this posterior wall of the fundus and take it out laterally. This is the area where you tend to have the most redundancy of the stomach, and uh, if you don't provide proper lateral retraction, you can end up with a fairly large portion of stomach proximally up here by the GE junction. Sorry about this here. We've got a slide skipping around. This is the uh, uh, final view of our uh, firing. Uh, at this point, I'm typically using a gold load high up, uh, which is a slightly smaller staple height than the green load. Um, and I usually use the GE fat pad as a landmark, staying just lateral to that. Again, you don't want to have a staple line that's flush with the esophagus. I think you want to have a little bit of tissue lateral. You don't want to go too far lateral because you're going to leave too much stomach on there. But I think the sweet spot is probably about a centimeter off the esophagus. Uh, once you have your uh, uh, sleeve uh, complete or your stomach completely transected, uh, the next step is specimen extraction, and you've got two options. One is just to bring it out through your 15 millimeter trocar site here, uh, uh, or you can put it in a bag and bring it out. We did a study looking at uh, cost effectiveness, and we found that we saved about a little over $200 a case by just taking it out uh, without a bag. We also found that if you put it in a bag, it, it bunches the stomach up, and often you have to make a bigger uh, incision and fascial incision, which uh, increases the pain and probably the hernia risk. Uh, we had a very low infection uh, uh, rate with this, at less than 2% with this technique. In terms of miscellaneous uh, uh, perioperative uh, uh, issues, uh, at the end of the procedure, I usually leak test with the endoscope. And I think more importantly, it gives you a nice uh, a view of the um, uh, lumen of the sleeve to see if there's any abnormal twisting or narrowing. I, I routinely use a 10 millimeter flat JP, although I think this can be the efficacy of this can be debated. Uh, I typically check a drain amylase uh, uh, just prior to removing the uh, JP, um, uh, just prior to discharge home. Uh, the patients stay on clear liquids for a week. Uh, for the first 50 sleeves that I did, I, I would routinely get an upper GI. It didn't change anything I did. We never saw a leak. Um, and the patients routinely uh, dreaded it. Uh, so my routine now is to uh, uh, not routinely study the sleeve. If I have a concern for a leak, I'd usually scan the patient with oral contrast. Oh, great, Tim. Thank you um, very much. Um, another excellent uh, lecture.